Many WMI classes expose methods that cause the class to take some action. For the core classes in the root sim v2 namespace, these methods, when available, are often your only means of making configuration changes. Many methods accept one or more arguments, or parameters, which customize a method's behavior. For example, a reconfiguration method might accept arguments that specify the new configuration settings. Sometimes a method may allow you to invoke it without specifying some arguments. For example, a method that can reconfigure 10 different settings might allow you to omit any settings you do not want to change. In those instances, Windows PowerShell usually requires you to specify the special dollar sign null constant for the argument, rather than providing a normal value. The invoke WMI method is one way to invoke WMI methods, and it is the primary method you will use in this class. You can run this commandlet by itself, specifying a class, namespace, computer name, credential, and other parameters such as you would when using getWMI object. In addition, you can specify the name of the method to invoke and provide any parameters. You can also retrieve WMI objects by using getWMI object and then pipe those objects to invoke WMI method. When you use this technique, you only need to provide the method name and arguments, since the WMI objects themselves will provide the rest of what invoke WMI method requires. Here's an example that retrieves a service object from one or more remote computers and executes the change method of each one. The change method has numerous parameters. By passing dollar sign $null to the ones we don't care about, we're telling the method that we don't want to change those particular items like the service's name, startup mode, and so on. All we're focused on is the password that the service uses to log on, which is one of the last parameters. You'll notice that executing a WMI method returns a result object, which tells you if the method was successful or not. If you don't need that information, you can pipe the output to out null to suppress it. Unfortunately, invoke method isn't always able to invoke all of the methods on a WMI object, particularly with some of the so-called system methods that are part of WMI itself, rather than part of an individual object. In these cases, you may need to use an alternate means of invoking methods that does not involve using a commandlet. Instead, you directly invoke the method of the WMI objects themselves. When you are doing so for multiple WMI objects, you will typically use for each object to enumerate the WMI objects and invoke a given method on each object, one at a time. For example, suppose you retrieve a set of WMI objects. Those WMI objects are placed into the pipeline. If they are piped to for each object, you will be able to specify a script block that executes once for each object in the pipeline. The curly braces contain the code you want to execute. Within that script block, the shell will look for the special dollar sign underscore placeholder and replace it with the current pipeline object. To call a method of the pipeline WMI object, type a period followed by the method name. Any arguments that you need to pass to the method would be enclosed in parenthesis in a comma separated list. If there are no arguments, the parentheses are still required. It is extremely common to use for each object in this manner when you are working with WMI objects. Here's another example of executing a WMI method this time using the older for each object approach. Within the curly braces is the code that for each object will execute for each object that is piped into it. The dollar sign underscore placeholder gives us access to the incoming WMI objects. By following that placeholder with a dot, we're telling the shell that we want to access a property or method of the incoming object. We then specify the method name and its parameters to complete the task. Some methods, especially those which perform security-sensitive operations, may require extended privileges. These privileges are not quite the same thing as permissions. Even though as an administrator you may have permission to perform these tasks, the extended privilege acts as a sort of safety lockout to prevent you from doing something accidentally, such as clearing the security event log or restarting a computer. To enable extended privileges, Use the Enable All Privileges commandlet parameter. Method documentation, if it exists, generally specifies when an extended privilege is available. 
Windows PowerShell does not enable specific extended privileges. Using the commandlet parameter enables all available extended privileges. The Enable All Privileges switch must be specified when the WMI objects are retrieved. In this example, that means using the switch with GetWMI object because it is retrieving the objects. Unfortunately, WMI remains complex because it has been inconsistently implemented across various Microsoft product groups. That means that different bits of WMI work in different ways and that it can be challenging to figure out how to use WMI in specific situations. The problem is compounded by the fact that much of WMI is inconsistently and poorly documented, giving you no place to turn to for examples of how to accomplish some tasks. WMI is not going away, but over time, more and more of the tasks you need to accomplish will be wrapped into task-specific commandlets. Those commandlets may still use WMI under the hood, but you don't need to care. The commandlets will provide you with a better documented, more consistent means of accomplishing tasks. So WMI isn't going away, but you as an administrator will need to deal with it less and less over time. Here's an example. In the past, you might have used WMI to retrieve a Win32 operating system object from one or more remote computers and enumerate through those objects to execute their reboot methods. In version 2 of PowerShell, however, you'd simply use the built-in restart computer commandlet. Does it still just use WMI under the hood? Maybe, but who cares? You're accomplishing the task and it doesn't matter what underlying technology is doing the heavy lifting. Events are special signals triggered by portions of the Windows operating system in response to things that happen. For example, moving your mouse across a dialog box generates mouse move events that are sent to each user interface element that your mouse passes over. Events allow your code to respond to those occurrences. Windows Management Instrumentation, WMI, is also capable of producing events, and Windows PowerShell V2 can register to receive those events. The shell can then execute whatever commands you like in response to those events. Typically, WMI will raise one of a fairly small number of events, but it can do so for a huge range of different WMI classes. There are three keys to using WMI events. Knowing what event you want, knowing what class you want the event for, and using the register WMI event commandlet to register for event notifications. You can run the help command shown to learn more about the events, and we'll look at a demonstration next. You'll learn more about other kinds of events that PowerShell can respond to later in this video. Perhaps the most useful events are some of the system-level events that WMI can produce. For example, an event called Instance Creation Event is fired whenever a new instance of a WMI class is created. Instance Deletion Event fires whenever an instance is deleted. This might not seem useful, but think about it. Almost every element of an operating system and computer hardware is represented by some instance of a WMI class. For example, Win32 Logical Disk will get a new instance when you attach a removable storage device. Win32 Process will lose an instance when a process quits. Want to display a message when users insert a new USB drive? Register WMI Event Query Select Star from Instance Creation Event within 5 where target instance is a Win32 Logical Disk action, right? You had better not put any proprietary information on that! That query can be pretty difficult to break down. So here's what it's doing. Select star from instance creation event, that's two underscores in the event name by the way, simply specifies that all properties from that event should be retrieved. Within five indicates that we only want to check for events every five seconds. Don't set this number too low or you'll end up with lots of computing power spent on constantly checking for updates. Where target instance is a Win32 logical disk, tells WMI that we only want events that created a new instance of the Win32 Logical Disk class. Finally, the action parameter is a script block, enclosed in braces, that contains the action we want to occur when the event is raised. A neat trick is to use the computer name parameter to register for events that occur on a remote computer. Very cool! You do need to be a local administrator on the remote computer, and the action will happen on your computer not on the remote one. As an aside, 
Don't be tempted to register for instance creation events on the SIM data file class that represents files on disk. WMI isn't very efficient at monitoring for new file creation. It will likely miss events and can impose some pretty heavy overhead in trying to catch everything. Don't forget about the underscore server property that is automatically added to every WMI object. It contains the computer name that the WMI object came from and provides you with a way to sort by computer name. You can also use the property for some pretty advanced online commands, using the server property to make additional WMI queries to the same computer. Let's look at an example. Here's a powerful one-liner that utilizes the underscore underscore server property. It starts with a normal call to get WMI object. That object is piped into the Select Object commandlet, which is used to select one or two interesting properties that we want to see. A hash table is used to define a new property, one which did not natively exist on the object that was piped in. This new property is given a label, and the expression is a script block that defines what the property will contain. Here, the expression is actually executing getWMIObject again. It's using the previous WMI objects underscore underscore server property to query a second WMI object from the same computer. Notice that the entire get WMI object call is in parenthesis. That means the parenthesis represent the result of that call, meaning they represent the WMI object that was returned. A period enables us to access properties of that object, which is what will be assigned as the value of this new property. Running it, you can see that information from two WMI classes has been combined into one, a very useful trick that doesn't really require any formal programming or scripting.